specializing in websites and WordPress. Um, over the last two years, I've also been an active community member in the web accessibility community, um, advocating for it at numerous work camps. Did about eight last year, and if all goes well, I'll do about a dozen this year. And my focus is advocating and um, opening the doors to what web accessibility is, and more importantly, why it's important. So that's what you're going to get out of it. It's not really, uh, I know that on the schedule, I got like an orange band for design. This doesn't have anything to do with design. I'm going to throw that up there now because anyone is under that impression. Um, it's, and this is also not going to be um, very development intensive either. Uh, the focus is really going to be on the fundamentals. So I'm going to give you all the little bits and pieces that you're going to need to understand it. And with the hopes that um, you'll go home and look into it further. And hopefully, by the end of it, I can inspire everyone here to make their WordPress websites a lot more accessible. So basically, it would be very fundamental. And um, we'll just get started. Uh, so yeah, you can uh, mention me at DirtyQ416 on Twitter. Um, if you want to throw up a tweet, um, try and include Hashtag A11Y. That's the short form for accessibility. Okay, and um, if enough of us uh, do that today, then you know, hopefully the word will spread and more people will um, you know, take notice of what the web accessibility is. So I encourage everyone to tweet, please mention me, mention hashtag A11Y. Let's spread the word. Let's really get it out there. And um, hopefully it will snowball. Follow suit, and uh, we can definitely make the internet a better place for everybody. So I'll jump right in. What is web accessibility? Um, a show of hands here. How many people develop websites or WordPress websites? Okay, so a good chunk of people. Awesome. Um, now, when I say the word web accessibility, how many people don't really know what that entails? Don't be shy. See some honest hands here. Great, great, great. I like to see that people don't know. Because my job is going to be to teach you. Okay. So to start, we're going to go into um, literal def a literal definition of it, which I pulled from uh, an online resource. We'll talk about some misconceptions, what people have misbeliefs on what accessibility really is. Uh, we'll talk about some benefits and more benefits. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what it means to me. So according to the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative, W3C being the World Wide Web Consortium, web accessibility that means that people with disabilities can use the web. More specifically, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web. Those four key points are the real um, meat and potatoes of accessibility. Perceive, understand, navigate, and interact. And that they can contribute to the web. Right? So we're not just focusing on making the web more accessible, but we also want to make web tools more accessible, like WordPress. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I got this. This is a pretty much an exact definition from a resource online from the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative page itself. This is where I got that from. Um, this is just a little brief snippet of the full definition. Um, but you kind of get a good sense of what it is. Well, basically the idea is to make it inclusive. You don't want to leave anybody out. Um, most people don't know what. The number is about roughly 20% of the world's population has some form of disability. And that increases with age. So consider that, you know, as all of us grow in age, um, you know, imagine, you know, in in your time of old age, you experienced the internet, you've been influenced by it, and imagine you could no longer use it. It would be pretty devastating, right? It would really suck. If at the end of it all, you love the internet, you used it, you made your money on it, and then at some point you could no longer use it because it's no longer accessible to you. Right? So it's not just about the 20%, it's about the future of you. It's about the you that may get into an accident, get hit by a car, you can no longer walk, you can no longer move your arms. These types of things. So it's it's a little bit less about the 20%, it's more about everybody. 
Some misconceptions. That's scary, man. Are you walking dead fence here? No, no, don't be shy. One, two, three, okay. Some misconceptions. Web accessibility is hard. It's time consuming. It's costly. It's ugly. It's scary.
perfect blind testing. Google can interpret and understand your site, then you're probably more accessible than, than not, uh, which is definitely a bonus. And another benefit is a sense of satisfaction that you have improved the internet experience for something with a challenge. Who can use a little sense of satisfaction in life, right? Come on. So what it means to me, and this is a quote from an article I wrote for HeroPress.com. HeroPress is actually a really cool site. Um, it, it's basically a collection of articles on how WordPress has impacted specific individuals. And so I wrote a piece on how uh, WordPress, how things like the internet and WordPress power websites, but it can also empower individuals. Right? So the internet is a tool. Communication tool, it's a networking tool, it's a commerce tool. Uh, you can start a business online, you can check the news, you can interact with your friends across the world. It's a tool. Everyone uses it, everyone loves it. Um, but for people that have limited opportunities, like myself, I mean, you know, growing up, I wasn't going to be a firefighter, I wasn't going to be a professional baseball player, and the internet gave me uh, opportunity to build. To, build, uh, to, to create my own success. So, although the uh, physical world had many boundaries, the virtual world didn't. And I was able to break down those boundaries. I was able to create something, build on it, and so basically, the idea is that um, if we can further break down those barriers, then others may also be empowered by the internet as well. Right? So, check out that article. It's a great site. There's a lot of great uh, topics on there. That was just a little snippet from it. But the idea is that um, if we all contribute to making the web a more accessible place, then we can all help empower other individuals that may have limited options. And that's just a small piece of what accessibility is. That's kind of what it meant to me. That's why I got involved. Because uh, it did a lot for me, and I think it could do a lot for others um, that may not have as many opportunities as, as the rest of the world. So definitely check out HeroPress, great site. So we're going to get into some key web accessibility terms. So first we're going to discuss some compliance guidelines, which is the normal legal end, uh, Section 508, which is American legislation. Uh, we'll get into some assistive technologies. A lot of people um, have not been exposed to the other technologies that are out there outside of the mouse and keyboard setup. There are so many other tools out there that people are using to interact with computers. Not just keyboard, not just um, a mouse. There's a whole bunch of other things out there. And it's important to understand what they are so that you can properly, um, again, it goes back to the user experience and the user interface. You understand how others are interacting with their computer. And then, you know, it, it kind of makes the whole web accessibility thing uh, kind of come together. We'll also talk about web accessibility evaluation, so that's like auditing, reporting, and analysis. Web accessibility semantics, that goes into like HTML, and ARIA, and JavaScript. We'll also talk about visual web accessibility, and that comes down to like the design end, uh, keyboard navigation, content accessibility, and web accessibility tools. So our first term is W3C, W3C. That's the Web Accessibility Initiative of the World Wide Web Consortium. You can find the link at www.w3.org slash WAI. It's basically everything you need to know about this specific Web Accessibility Initiative. There's a lot of stuff there. It's a pretty lengthy read, but it's very detailed, and it's not above and beyond anyone's comprehension. It's not like super technical, or they don't use a lot of technical terms, they kind of uh, make it very basic so that anyone can go online and read it and understand it. Um, this is pretty much, uh, so the W3C WAI is essentially the governing kind of uh, standard for web accessibility. So this is kind of where it all starts. So anyone that really wants to get to know about web accessibility should start here because it outlines the different areas, uh, different people that are impacted by it, and uh, different ways to go about uh, Resolving certain issues as well. And it's a lengthy read, but it's definitely worth the time. 
The second key term is WCAG 2.0. That is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. So these are the actual specific guidelines where it tells you each area of web accessibility as well as the different uh, compliance levels. So WCAG 2.0 comes in three compliance levels. Single A, double A, triple A. Single A obviously being you know, minimal efforts, triple A being full out efforts on web accessibility. Generally with um, most sites, you can easily achieve single A and double A. It's a bit tricky because it deals with a lot of specifics. Um, so it, it can be a bit tough, but the first two, you can pretty much get that compliance level on any WordPress site from what I can see from what we've done. It's definitely doable. So take any you know, well-developed, well-designed site, you can definitely have it up to double A compliancy. So this is the specific guidelines. Um, it is another lengthy read, but it's definitely detailed. It definitely has all the bits and pieces you need to understand web accessibility in its entirety. Um, so definitely another good read. If you want to really get to know web accessibility, check it out. If you've got a whole week of nothing to do, then you can spend it reading that. Section 508. A lot of you know about Section 508, but it's the Rehabilitation Act. So it's a series of legislation that were passed in order to enforce accessibility, uh, not just on the web, but in general. Right? Employment, transportation, building structures, um, customer service, the whole run, right? Trying to make the world a more accessible place. It does have specifics on web accessibility, but um, it's generally a we have a similar one in, in Canada as well, in Ontario, which is where I'm from, uh, which is called the AODA. Essentially, in 2005, the province of Ontario determined that in 20 years they wanted to be the most accessible province in Canada. So, 10 years in, unfortunately, the progress hasn't been going as well as people want it to go. And I think the major is issue is um, enforcement. So they're not slapping the wrist on those that aren't doing it, and they're not patting the backs on those who do. So there's really no incentive out there for people to get involved and to do it. I think that's the real crutch with um, progress, especially in Ontario. Not to say that you know, people should be um, influenced by a negative or positive um, outcome, but it, it does have an impact in, in, in Ontario. Right now, the legislation dictates that any company with 50 or more employees have to have accessible uh, materials, communications, you know, online, print, uh, PDFs, the whole gap. It's got to be accessible. So there's not a lot of companies in jump ship yet, but I think once they start to understand the importance of it, you know, you know, they'll be more inspired and they'll be more ambitious about kind of taking it to the next level. So the, the laws are out there. But um, you know, people just really need to kind of get on board, which is kind of why I do these talks. It's not really to, you know, it, it would be difficult for me to teach you how to make a site accessible in 45 minutes. Basically impossible. Maybe in like a few days, sure, but with this short period of time, it would literally be impossible for me to teach you how to make a site accessible. But what I can do is I can show you why it's important, I can give you the bits and pieces for you to go home and learn more. Hopefully that takes these legislations to the next level. Uh, inspiring individuals, uh, inspiring companies to kind of do better, do more accessibility. Web accessibility auditing. So this is a process where you take a site that's already been developed, um, and then it, you can use various tools to analyze. So it goes through all of your scripts, all of your content, it tells you what's good, what's bad, and what compliance level you're achieving. And obviously, you can build a report that you can hand to any developer and say, here you go. Please do these things, and this will ensure that our site is more accessible. One tool out there that's worth mentioning is called Tenon.io. T-E-N-O-N.io. This is actually a very new and revolutionary tool. Um, it was developed by uh, two people, one of which was Carl Groves. I don't know if anyone knows him, but he's actually a pioneer in web accessibility. He's done a lot of great work. I know him personally. He's an awesome guy. And he built this tool 
understanding the industry, understanding what people need to successfully audit their sites, as well as um, build the proper reports so that developers can easily um, fix the issues. Uh, the great thing about Tenant.io is it's got some really, really cool features that other tools don't. So it's got, uh, it's got a priority system in place where it basically, you can kind of dictate at what level certain issues are on a priority list, right? So um, if, let's say, the issue ranks at 100% priority, then that's probably something you're going to want to take care of right away. If it's got like a 20%, then, you know, it's something that you could you know, release in the future. As well, it also has an impact rate. So it's going to tell you how many, or, or percentage of people will be impacted by it. So if a certain issue has 100% impact, that means that it's probably affecting a large amount of people with challenges or disabilities versus something that has a lower impact may only affect a small number of people with a very specific disability, whether it be visual impairment, motor impairment, etc. So um, it also has a really cool feature where you can um, test different screen sizes. So if you want to test mobile screen size or projector screen size, you have that flexibility. And you can also um, you can also input user agents, so you can also put different browsers. You can test on Firefox, you can test on Chrome, you can test on IE, you can test on mobile browsers as well. As long as you know the name of that user agent, you can plug it in, it's going to do an accurate testing on those, which is far beyond what any other particular tool can do. Um, there is a WordPress plugin, it's called Access Monitor. It connects to the tenant.io uh, database. So basically, you install the plugin, you run it, it gives you a report on all the issues that are within your WordPress site, in which case you can then obviously fix them as you go. I'm sorry, I'm also, a bunch of other tools. What was that plugin I mentioned that one, but there are plenty out there. I'll definitely look into them if you're interested in taking any of your existing sites and making them more accessible. You're going to want a uh, proper Assistive technologies. It's reading, navigating, interacting devices. Like I mentioned before, there are many, many other ways to interact with a computer outside of your standard keyboard and mouse setup. Like lots of different ways. I'm going to show you a few. Here are a bunch of various mouse and keyboard alternatives. You've got joysticks, you've got trackballs, um, even up to one button, which means that somebody with severe motor uh, disability may only have the motion to click one button. Which means if your site cannot operate with a single click navigation, that guy's out of luck. I've used some of these in the past, I no longer do because I've adapted and you know, as I've grown I've kind of come up with my own methods. But as a child growing up, I definitely utilized a lot of these tools and it did help. It, it, it meant Certain interactions were difficult, and these definitely make, make them very easy. Right? So, a lot of alternatives, this is just a small chunk of what's really out there, but I think it's good for you to know that people aren't just using keyboard mouse, are alternatives. Braille keyboard, how awesome is that? Plug it into your laptop, and uh, you can type using Braille. Phenomenal. Sip and puff. This gentleman is inhaling and exhaling into this device, which is in turn interacting with the computer. He's typing. He doesn't have to move a muscle. He just has to breathe in, breathe out. Those actions do different things, and uh, they, they call different actions uh, on the computer. Type, click, whatever it is. You program it to do different things. Right? And, that, and that's actually a very common tool. A lot of people with severe motor disabilities Use a sip and puff device for a lot of different types of interaction. So you definitely want to make sure that, you know, if at the least, you want to have a very simple way to navigate through your site so that somebody may only have a 
thought it was super cool. Uh, I didn't even know if it was real. In Montreal, uh, two weeks ago, there happened to be a scientist in this crowd. And he actually confirmed that this stuff is real. So it plugs into the brain waves and uh, the, that's the uh, I'm not a scientist, I don't know. But it's cool anyways. Uh, so you've got the brain computer interface. This guy is just thinking. He's interacting with his computer. How awesome is that? So there's a lot of different, like I said, a lot of different assistive technologies out there. A lot of different tools that people are using to interact with computers, technology, and the web. Definitely important for everyone to understand that those are out there. That's why web accessibility is important. Because the people that use these tools need that accessibility built into the websites in order for them to interact with these tools. So without web accessibility, these tools wouldn't work as well. They wouldn't be effective. Now, there's a couple of other things. Um, there's also a screen reader for those that have visual impairments. And the screen reader essentially reads out what's on your screen. So those that can't see, it gives you an uh, audio representation of all the text and tags that are on your site. So without proper web accessibility semantics and without proper content accessibility, the screen reader, it, it, it just doesn't work because it's just, you know, imagine it's reading out a whole bunch of stuff. The person that's hearing it can't understand what's going on. They're probably not going to want to go back to your site over again. You're probably going to be very discouraged with the internet at that point. So it's important to understand that there's all these devices, and again, these are only a few examples. There's so many more. You know, I could have spent the whole session showing you different images and assistive technologies. But the idea is just to kind of give you a scope of different types of severity, different types of uh, technologies that are out there to combat different disabilities. And Without accessibility, again, these technologies uh, won't will work so well. So web accessibility semantics. It's basically just HTML, right? H1, H2 tags. A lot of people don't realize that H1, H2 is not a design. Um, it's not a design tag. It's not, it was never meant for design. It was actually built for uh, web structure. So based on an H1 tag basically indicates that you're entering a new block on the website, a new block of content. Um, H2 is a subheading of that initial block. So when you're using H1, H2 tags, you want to use them in a way that's effectively sectionalizing the different, uh, uh, sec the different sections of your website. Right? The first block of content, the second block of content, and so on and so forth. H1, H2 tags are actually very important. Link text, it's basically using proper descriptive words to kind of paint a picture as to what that link is or what it's going to do. If it's going to go to a new tab, you want to tell that person. You're going to be entering into a new page. You don't know what you can expect, but whatever happens on that end, it's not the original site. So you want to be descriptive, you want to let people know what the link is, where it's going to go, what it's going to then we have ARIA. And that's Accessible Rich Internet Applications. ARIA is essentially, essentially an extension of HTML. So you get uh, landmarks, roles, you assign roles to different HTML elements like buttons, forms, uh, pop up windows, etc. So basically, for things like screen readers, for things like different assistive technologies, it can then interpret and say, okay, this is a button. This is what it should do. This is how it works. So, uh, ARIA is essentially an extension of HTML, but it has all the necessary accessibility features that you need to kind of extend the overall accessibility of your website. The key with ARIA is to not overuse it. A lot of people, when I tell them about it, they think that more is better. The general rule is if HTML can do it, then you don't need ARIA. But if HTML can't accomplish, specific accessibility requirement, uh, then ARIA is there to kind of back it up. So it's a great, um, it's a great tool, definitely worth looking into. It's got a lot of great um, aspects to it, and it's uh, definitely being more widely used on the internet now. <coughs> so visual web accessibility. Fonts. You know, small fonts are bad. Some people can't read small fonts. Uh, scripty fonts. That font is so pretty, like, but if it impedes the ability for somebody to read it and understand it, then it's not good. It's actually kind of um, color contrast. It's hugely important for those that have 
visual impairments, right? Like having a blue text on top of a darker blue background, or orange on top of red. Those contrasts are way too close together. They can almost be um, blended to those that have visual impairments. They just see a blur of color. They can't distinguish between the two. So you want, generally, the rule is the 80-20 rule. There's a bunch of guidelines and tools that you can go online and actually figure out the best way to color contrast. So let's say you have a color in mind that you want to use. You go online, you know, put that hexadecimal in. And it's going to tell you like the proper casting colors you should use. You know, so for instance, if anyone's noticed my presentation is all gray background, black text, color contrast. It's good. Everyone has been able to read and understand my slides, right? So I've done a good job. And so, you know, a lot of the times, got white backgrounds with like gray text. All these new themes have this very faint text on them. They're difficult to read for some people. Why not just have a solid color contrast so that people get to say, read it, understand it. And it goes a long way. So in terms of design, those are the two main elements of like, visual accessibility. With the fonts, you can get different tools that increase or decrease the size of your fonts, like right on your web page, those are generally helpful because then you can kind of set yourself on one font and then have a tool where somebody can go in and increase the size of that font if they can't read it and vice versa. So there's a lot of tools that can help you with the, the visual end of it, um, but there's also, you know, from a design point of view, it's also definitely very important. So keyboard navigation. This comes back to being able to Navigate with you know, keyboard navigation really just means any type of assistive technology. So if I just had that one button, that would kind of fall in keyboard navigation. The best and easiest way to test for keyboard navigation is go to a site and unplug your mouse. Just use tab, enter, arrows. See how far you get. If you, if you become extremely frustrated, you imagine the guy is not using a keyboard or mouse. Not that how they're in and interact with that set. Probably not going to be very pleasant. Um, so things like focus. So focus is essentially the equivalent of roll. So you want, you know, when you roll over a button, something happens. You can tell the user that that's a button. This is what you're clicking on. Focus kind of does the same thing. You're tapping through a site. There should be some visual indication of where that person is. If they're just tapping away and they have no idea where they're tapping, then how are they ever going to get it? It's just going to be frustrating. The likelihood that that person's probably going to come back to your set. So focus is essentially like, well, think of it that way. You want a visual indication of where that person's tapping. Uh, tab index is essentially, you can basically uh, dictate when you press the tab key where it goes. Generally, it only uses a zero and a one. So one is in, zero is out. Let's say you have a pop-up window, you tap into it, and you can program next tab stroke to be to close it or to go to the next section of that pop-up window. So you kind of predetermine what order tabbing is going to work. And then you have skip links. Has anyone seen skip link before? If you log into your WordPress admin, like anyone can do it right now, and you hit tab, the first thing you'll see is a skip link. It's going to say skip to content, which means it's bypassing the menu. Now, as, as, as you all know, the WordPress menu is pretty big. You've got dashboard, you've got plugins, you've got posts, you've got pages, you've got users, appearance, etc., etc., etc. Imagine you had to tab through that every time you got to a page. You'd probably be tabbing 20 times before you got to the content itself, which is daunting. Nobody wants to have to tab that much. So, Skip basically says skip the menu and go right to the content. So, when you hit that skip link, Bypassing the menu, I don't have to tab through that anymore. And now what I'm tabbing is the content. Whether if it's a form, it's going to start with field one, tab, field two, tab, field three, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important. So if you've got big menus, you don't want to necessarily force your user to tab through a giant menu because that sucks. So skip links is important. Like I said, if anyone logs into their WordPress backend and they hit tab, you'll see it in full force. So the, the WordPress accessibility group has uh, gone to place to ensure that WordPress core itself is accessible. So they've added this to make to make, them, you know, to make uh, keyboard navigation or assistive technology navigation that much more easier. Content 
accessibility. Um, images. All tagging your images paints a picture for those that can't see the image. So the alt tag should be a nice description of what that image is. Now, if the image does not have any impact on the content, you don't need to have an alt tag. If it's just part of the design, let's say. You know, maybe it's a background image on your head. You don't necessarily need to have an alt tag because it's just a visual component. It has no impact on the content. But, if you've got a blog post, you've got this nice image of work at Boston, all these people enjoying my presentation, I want to add a little alt text so that somebody with a screen reader can say, you know what, that's an image of Jordan presenting to a lovely crowd of eager people learning about web accessibility. That way, you paint a picture for somebody that can't see that image. They, you know, it's in context with the rest of the content, and it helps, you know, overall, people, are, people can understand what that image is and what it's there. There's also video transcription for those that have uh, hearing impairments. Uh, just transcri transcribing your uh, video with text definitely goes a long way. Um, there's a lot of tools that can do it, they don't do it very well. But normally, what I do is, is I transcribe the videos with the tool and then I go back and I edit it manually. So at least I don't have to like do all the work from scratch. I get a rough draft of that transcript and then I just go in and I edit it manually, and, and then I can get uh, a very specific and very uh, accurate transcription of the video. There's also things like PDFs, those can also be made accessible. That's kind of another area, it doesn't really fall under the web accessibility category, but it's out there. So that anyone that deals with PDFs, uh, there's also methods that you can make those keyboard, nav uh, keyboard navigation accessible, as well as your visuals and other things like that. So content accessibility is important. So not only does the website itself have to be accessible, but the content you dump in there should be accessible as well. So a two component uh, process. Development and content. I just got the five minute now. I still have lots of stuff. So we got accessibility tools, testing user agents, inter browsers, browser extensions, stuff like that. Um, there's a browser out there called eCentral. It's basically just an accessible browser, kind of like your Chrome or Internet Explorer. Really cool. So we're getting to WordPress accessibility, community core themes and plugins. So WordPress does have an accessibility group. There are a series of volunteers that dedicate their time to testing newer versions of WordPress core that go out. Um, so before major release goes out, uh, these guys test it, audit it, send the reports back to the dev team, and they implement as much as they can. Um, to learn more about core accessibility from this page, actually these are the guidelines of what they test, and it should, it actually, uh, you can actually get reports on previous testing and stuff like that. Uh, so they do a lot of great work. Um, like I said, every major release gets tested so that the tool itself is successful. Right? That, that means that People with challenges can use WordPress to build sites. So not only are they able to view sites, but they can build it as well. Which comes back to the contribution point in my previous uh, blurb about uh, web accessibility, right? So not only do we want people to be able to use the web, we want people, uh, people with challenges to be able to build tools and build sites for the web as well. And that's where core accessibility comes into play. We want to ensure that WordPress core is accessible for those with challenges can go in websites. And that's kind of an awesome thing. So WordPress accessible themes. Um, there's a, a, a new tag was introduced a few months back. Accessibility hyphen ready. And so anyone that builds an accessible theme gets, to, um, gets their theme processed through uh, a formal audit. So you submit your accessible theme, it gets audited, if it comes back Good, then you get added to the repository under that tag. Started out with a handful, and within three months, they're at about 50 accessible themes, which is awesome. More developers are jumping ship, they're getting on board with accessibility ready themes, and uh, more and more people are developing them. A lot of them are really nice, uh, a lot of them are um, boilerplate, it's very basic, which we really build on top of, but all the semantics are in there. So you've got all your Accessible HTML, all your proper tags, H1, H2, REX, etc. Now, an accessible theme doesn't 
doesn't necessarily give you an accessible site. You have to ensure that the content at these themes is properly tagged, etc., so that you have a full, full circle of accessible site. But these will give you a good starting point. Again, it's got all the semantics and all the programming is properly done so that, that they're accessible. WordPress accessibility plugins. Um, there are a bunch of plugins out there now that can extend the accessibility of your website. So there's a WP accessibility, and that fixes a bunch of common issues with WordPress front end and back end accessibility. Um, now there's Gravity Forms, Content Form 7 uh, extensions that make your forms more accessible. There's Facebook and Twitter feed plugins. Uh, our extensions that are now accessible, and so on and so forth. Uh, little fonts, resizers, different zoom tools, etc., etc. Um, it started out with a small bunch of tools, and now there's a nice long list. Definitely worth checking out. They're easy to install, they're easy to use, and they go a long way. I know I don't have any time, so I'm going to skip that slide. But if you have any questions, I'm going to be around all day. Um, definitely you know, approach me, ask me questions. I love talking accessibility. I love opening people's minds to it. I love inspiring people. And if you have any questions, you can definitely ask me on Twitter. Email me, call me, find me, stalk me, whatever you want. Just ask me. And I'd like to thank you all. Hope that I've inspired you enough to go home, learn more about the finer details about accessibility, and make your eyesight more accessible.